Welcome back, everyone. We're going to reconvene. It's my pleasure to convene and chair our second session on the churches of Philip and Mark, the Christian Nile. My name is Charles Stang. I hail from the Divinity School and the Center for the Study of World Religions. Um, unlike Michael, our previous chair, I can't claim to work in the field of Christian Nile uh, exactly, so I, will be, I won't be extemporizing um, my introductions. These are going to be fairly straightforward. Um, but I'm very happy to welcome our first speaker, um, Elizabeth Bowman, who is the uh, LCB Smith Professor in the Humanities and Chair of the Department of Art History, Art and Art Education at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Her research and writing engage with late antique and Byzantine visual culture of the Eastern Mediterranean, and she will be speaking today on Egyptian Christian visual culture from the 5th through 14th centuries. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bowman. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm honored by the invitation to participate in this wonderful event. And I just want to make note of an extraordinary moment that happened uh, in the Q&A when our, our last speaker um, commented on the Latins being provincial. And no one laughed or objected, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So anyway, I've, I've learned so much. I've rarely been at an event that has excited me more. And, um, pleased to be able to participate in it. So as this audience knows well, rich textual sources attest to the importance of Alexandria as a theological and ecclesiastical center in the late Roman period, and more broadly to the early flourishing of monasticism in Egypt. However, the extraordinary visual record is much less well known. While much has disappeared from major cities, substantial remains of fragile media, such as monumental painting in desert monasteries, are witness to the power of Christianity in Egypt from the 5th through the 14th centuries. <clears throat> These two archangels are painted wooden sculptures that were found recently in excavations at the monastery of Apa Apollo at Bawit in Upper Egypt. Outside of the major cities, an extraordinary quantity of wall paintings has also survived or has been documented in both small scale and monumental buildings. Textiles and painted sculpture in limestone and wood have also been preserved, along with objects in metal. Egypt played a central role in the early Byzantine Empire, and while demonstrating this point is beyond the scope of my paper today, the province was fully integrated. Therefore, the vast quantity of remains of visual culture in the northeastern corner of the continent of Africa attest to what would have been found elsewhere throughout the empire. These span a millennium from the 5th through the 14th centuries. I will focus today on two principal sites, the White Monastery Federation near Panopolis and the Monastery of St. Anthony at the Red Sea, although I will also mention some other monuments. Until very recently, the paintings at these monasteries had thick coats of soot and dust obscuring their view and making study of them at best very difficult and at worst impossible. The American Research Center in Egypt undertook conservation work with funding from the United States Agency for International Development in a cooperation between these entities, the Coptic Church, and the Egyptian Ministry of State for Antiquities. I worked on the St. Anthony Project as the art historian, and I founded and directed the Red Monastery Project. Some images will demonstrate the dramatic difference that conservation made. Here is a niche in the Red Monastery Church prior to cleaning. Here it is with one square cleaned. You can see part of a white curtain hanging from nails decorated with rosettes and pomegranates. Wow. Can you take that slide back again? Yep, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, right there. That's amazing. Yep, and, and wait for the next one now. Okay. <laughs> All right, and here you see the same niche again wow. on the left. What a nice audience this is, I must say. <laughs> uh, so this is how it appears today. How could a monument like this have been essentially overlooked? In the 20th century, art historians brought a host of racist baggage to their consideration of Egyptian Christian visual culture, concluding that everywhere in the province, with the possible exception of Alexandria and its environs, was a cultural backwater in which the best that people could create was folk art. 
It is not an overstatement to say that the conserved paintings at the Red Monastery have shown the falseness of these views and have completely transformed our understanding of the contribution of Upper Egypt to the larger uh, early Byzantine world. A similarly extraordinary contrast was apparent at the Monastery of St. Anthony, where I first began uh, my work with uh, these wonderful Italian conservators um, who conserved the, the Red Monastery Church also. The Byzantinist Thomas Whittemore had the Church of St. Anthony photographed at the beginning of the 20th century. You're looking at the same part of the church in these two images. So this archway here corresponds to this archway here. This bit of an arch and a column correspond to this area. And here's the Virgin Mary and the Christ child. And while I have this image up, I, I don't have another photograph that shows it at all later. Um, this is the corner of the church where the bulk of the Ethiopian inscriptions is. And I wonder if it has to do with devotion to the mother of God, just as an aside. In this view, the master conservator Adriano Luzzi completes work in the sanctuary in the Church of St. Anthony. The enlargement at the right shows how encrusted the paintings were prior to cleaning. While the church itself was well known before conservation, the paintings were covered with thick layers of soot and late, unprofessional repaintings. The depictions uncovered by the conservators are stunning and completely invalidate the standard scholarly opinion in the 20th century that Egyptian Christian visual culture withered after the Arab conquest in 641-642 CE. These paintings are now recognized as being one of the most powerful and best preserved 13th century Christian murals anywhere in the world. The medieval period in Egypt was a golden age of artistic and literary production for Christians, on which more later. So I hope everyone can see that this square here is what's shown in this view, and Adriano is removing layers of tissue paper that have absorbed some of the upper layers of the soot obscuring the paintings. So the process of conservation is a very long and, and uh, painstaking one, and this is just one step that he was um, involved in. <clears throat> We will now proceed chronologically, beginning with the White Monastery Federation, which was founded in the fourth century. It was located near Panopolis, a city which produced famous poets and also high quality textiles. The Federation included hundreds and very possibly thousands of members. A small number were hermits, but most lived in regimented communities. Two for men, today colloquially called the White and Red Monasteries, and one for women, a short distance to the south. The White Monastery Federation is best known for its brilliant and domineering third leader, Shenuta, whom you see here in a later painting in the Red Monastery. The material remains of monasticism at the women's community are quite sparse. A small church stands in ruins dwarf, uh, dwarfed by the remains of a Ptolemaic temple. The only explicitly Christian decoration of any kind that has been found there is this sculpture. It and recent graffiti discovered in an excavation there under the direction of Stephen Davis and Gillian Pike demonstrate unequivocally that this ancient temple was reused as the women's monastery. The male communities at the white and red monasteries had huge churches, as you will see in a moment. The absence of impressive visual culture here strongly suggests that female monastics had a far more modest built environment for prayer and ritual than men did. The decorum for large-scale monastic churches appears to have been gendered male. Built between 447 and 449, Shenuta's monumental church in the White Monastery matched in scale a contemporary basil Episcopal basilica at Herbopolis Magna. The abbot's interest in elevated status did not stop with architecture. Although refusing to become a bishop, he pursued many of the activities of these ecclesiastical elites, including ransoming captives and caring for the poor. So this, um, this is the current entrance into the White Monastery, and that it is taller than uh, um, six feet. Um, it's about, about six feet or a little bit more. So you can guess you know, at, at the huge scale of this church, uh, Dale Kinney, um, the late antique architectural historian has said that this was one of the most substantial architectural commissions of the, century, of, of the empire in this century. The exterior of Shenouda's church proclaims its Egyptian heritage with its reference to temple architecture. 
It copies the distinctive tapering walls topped with cavetto cornices seen in the Temple of Hathor at Dendera and other sites. The interior, however, is a triconch basilica, as is apparent in these plans of the White Monastery Church and the slightly later Red Monastery Church drawn to the same scale. So in these reconstructed plans, uh, sorry, the red isn't very clear, but this is the nave. Here's a raised platform leading into the three-lobed or triconch sanctuary, and the plan at the Red Monastery, uh, Monastery is essentially the same. This reconstruction of the Red Monastery Church illustrates what both would have looked like, generally speaking. And again, here is the nave. Here is the raised platform, with, which would have had some kind of a screen, whether low or high, we're not sure. And then the cutaway view shows the three lobes of the, of the sanctuary. The presence of the Roman basilica type is not surprising in Egypt. But what is unusual about this monument is the extraordinary complexity of the sanctuary, a deeply articulated triconch. This laser scan section and cutaway drawing of the Red Monastery Church illustrate the volumetric muscularity of the architecture. Contemporary basilicas in Constantinople and Rome may have had much more expensive stone cladding, but their sanctuary plans and wall treatment are considerably less exciting. Uh, so this is a drawing created from laser scan data, and it shows a, a section um, which gives you a view of the, at least part of the eastern lobe with its deep niches, and then deep niches on the, uh, on the upper level. In the cutaway view, you can see a little bit of that as well. And so these niches have attached columns and pilasters with gables on top and freestanding columns in front of them. So there's a tremendous amount of depth um, that's created with all of this. And in this type of architecture, the Red and White Monastery churches, quote, urban, imperial, and aristocratic uh, structures, such as this fountain building in Jerash. Their use in the remote White Monastery Federation is interesting. All three monuments were built with semi-domes, freestanding columns, and sculpted niches, and were finished with painted plaster. By choosing to construct an enormous and lavishly expensive church at the edge of the desert cliffs, Shenouta was changing the rules of monasticism and of society at large. So many great works of Christian art and architecture have been created in monasteries, such as this Romanesque cloister in Moissac, that we tend to think there is something natural about their existence in a monastic setting. The conjunction of monumental architecture and monasticism was, however, not an obvious or inevitable one. After all, monasticism meant leaving the world behind. Shenouta was one of the major players who joined these opposites, worldly beauty and asceticism, together. He was well over 100 years old when he died. He had raised the social and political profile of the monastery to remarkable heights and had also brought in considerable wealth. Although he repeatedly told his followers to bury him in a secret place without pomp and circumstance, they obviously felt compelled to treat him with all possible respect once he passed away. We know this because some distance to the northwest of his monumental church, Dr. Saad Mohammed Mohammed Osman discovered an underground painted tomb on top of which was a triconch funerary chapel. Subsequent work was undertaken under, under the direction of various people in collaboration with Dr. Saad and other members of the Egyptian Ministry of State for Antiquities and the Coptic Orthodox Church. <clears throat> the main burial chamber at the upper right is a low barrel vaulted space preceded by a vestibule with a shallow dome. In this view, you see the vestibule and some of its paintings. The subjects are common in funerary culture throughout the empire peacocks, eagles, sheep, and more. The artist has divided the vault of the tomb chamber into four rectangular fields with decorated frames. This photograph of the south wall shows two of these fields filled with gemmed crosses, flora, and fauna. This somewhat distorted view of all four fields shows you that the north side of the vault includes one gemmed cross and one figure with his arms raised. So these are the two crosses at the top, upside down, that we were just looking at. Here's a third cross, and then over here is a figure. 
Amazingly, an inscription above the central figure survives. It reads, in Greek, the holy tomb or shrine of Abba Shenuta, the Archimandrite. And as you can see, this translation is courtesy of our keynote speaker, Stephen Davis. <clears throat> the abbot is dressed in the uniform of his monastic federation, all except the apron and leather belt in white. He was flanked by two figures, probably angels. Shenouda's pose is that assumed still today by Christians in Egypt for prayer. We know from early texts that it imitated the crucified Christ on the cross. Thus, in this fourth field on the vault of his tomb, Shenouda takes the place of the gemmed crosses in the other three fields, assuming the role of Christ. A surprisingly large number of elite <clears throat> painted barrel vaulted tombs have, have survived in the Eastern Mediterranean. Shenouda's tomb is Egyptian only in that it shows the Egyptian abbot and that it is located in Egypt. About 40 years after Shenouda's death, the monks at the Red Monastery built a modified copy of the great abbot's church. In this view, you see reconstructed medieval walls that incorporate early Byzantine sculpted portals. So the portal on the north side is here. This is a drawing of the portal on the south side. The sanctuary at the Red Monastery is comprised of a monumental facade wall, which you see here, leading into the complex space of the triconch. In this view, we are looking east through the enormous arched opening of the facade wall. The following three images show a view looking up into the lobes. This first one is before conservation, or rather we had done some small test cleanings, but the rest of it is unconserved. Here it is after conservation, and my newest favorite view is this next one, which is a laser scan view taken as if from below floor level. So again, this is not a traditional photograph. Pietro Gaspari, who did the laser scanning, created this using his three-dimensional data. You couldn't take this unless you removed the floor by several feet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the triconch is exemplified by riotous ornamental painting, which covered the sanctuary facade and the walls, columns, niches, and vaults of the triconch itself. While other examples of lavishly colored and patterned interior decoration survive in the sturdy medium of mosaic, as here at Ravenna, only in the Red Monastery do we see more than traces of what was probably the most common medium used for embellishing early Byzantine architecture, namely paint. The complete surface coverage and bewildering array of ornament expressed an empire-wide aesthetic preference for variety, contrast, and color. The paintings in the Red Monastery Church demonstrate other clear ties to decorative programs elsewhere with figural representations. As just one example, the Moses iconography is very similar to that found in other major churches from this period in Ravenna and Sinai, showing Moses reaching up to heaven to receive the law. The Red Monastery Church is one spectacular example from the early Byzantine period, but it is not alone. Numerous Christians commissioned portable objects as well as wall paintings. As one example, I show here an extraordinary textile icon of the mother of God and Christ child below a Christ in majesty. Visual culture had social agency and imparted prestige to its patrons. One component of this was simply color. Multicolored interiors and objects were a characteristic of the elite. Figural representations served numerous roles, for example, as foci for devotion and as models for emulation. Multiple media styles and levels of expertise were available, and as mentioned earlier, the integration of Egypt into the empire means that these fragile remains, which have not uh, survived at all or well elsewhere, should be seen as generally speaking representative of what once existed along the north coast of Africa and around the rest of the Mediterranean as well. Before jumping about 700 years into the future, uh, I need to address the historical appropriateness of the word Coptic. The word Copt, which was derived from the Arabic word for Egyptian, Gipt, was introduced into Egypt only after the Arab conquest of 641, and thus when used for the earlier period is being imposed retroactively. 
Byzantine speakers of what we call Coptic would not have used that term. They would simply have spoken Egyptian. While I doubt that my colleagues who study texts will jettison the term Coptic for the language, it should at the very least never be used for any early Byzantine cultural production other than linguistic. The distinctive culture properly called Coptic developed in the late 9th or early 10th century along with the associated Arabization of the Christians of Egypt. This is over two centuries after the Muslim conquest. By the time that the monks in the monastery of St. Anthony at the Red Sea, uh, which you see here, had their church painted in the 13th century, the Copts had become native speakers of Arabic. In fact, the paintings belong to a flourishing period in Coptic culture, including not only the visual arts, but also Christian literature in Arabic. In Anamartyrorum 949, which is equivalent to 1232-1233 CE, the monks undertook a major renovation of their church. <clears throat> so here is the ground plan of the church, the current entrance here, a small side chapel, a two-parted nave, a hurus, which is a transitional uh, space between the nave and the sanctuary, and the sanctuary. And in this view, this is a separate building. You see the, the uh, huge domes over the, the nave, and the eastern part of the church is obscured by the palm trees. And this is an inscription which lists uh, over 30 people who contributed uh, to the uh, renovation of the church, who, painted, who paid for the, the painting. In the dome of the sanctuary, other inscriptions name the lead artist as Theodore, who's given the title or has given himself the title Zografos, which literally means writer of life. It's the term used for painters. The majority of the paintings comprise a wide band set about five feet above, above the floor level, as you see here. In the western half of the nave, a series of martyred equestrian saints encircles the viewer. So this shot was taken standing about here, looking towards the current entrance, and there's this band of equestrian saints that encircles you as you stand there in the western end of the nave. Standing monastic saints, most Egyptian, fill the eastern half of the nave. This is one of my favorites, Saint Macarios the Great, with the angelic creature grasping his wrist. The martyr saints on horseback protect the entrance in the western end of the nave, and the standing monastic saints at the eastern end assert the supreme importance of the ascetic life. The nave paintings craft a genealogy for the viewing monks, who had long since cast themselves as the successors to the martyrs, dying to the world in advance of their physical deaths. These paintings are bold and memorable with intense and sometimes also lively figures. For example, the small people climbing in the fruit trees of paradise in this painting of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The artists employed a distinctive palette with saturated darkish red, yellow ochre, and olive green colors. The strong outlining of all of the subjects and the stylization of the clothing enhance the richness of the overall effect. The three patriarchs are ordered right to left following Arabic reading convention, rather than left to right as we might expect. And in case you are wondering who the little guy at the far right is, this one here, he is uh, the rich man shown in hell who had lacked charity and spurned the beggar Lazarus. So unfortunately this part of the painting is missing, but these are almost certainly the feet of a figure like this one, but uh, or more like this one, the male who would have been um, understood to be Lazarus. The monks in the monastery of St. Anthony chose subject matter with a long history, as seen in these two-tiered depictions of Christ incarnate as a child with his mother in the lower zone, and again as God beyond space and time in the upper level. A circa 6th century image is on the left from the Monastery of Apopalo at Bawit, and an image from St. Anthony's is on the right. This iconographic continuity attests to a long and unbroken chain of transmission of both subject matter and the skills necessary to create monumental wall painting. In style, the 13th century paintings at St. Anthony's differ clearly from early Byzantine Egyptian Christian depictions, lacking fluid and organic rendering of three-dimensionality. 
In the later painting, heavy, heavy outlining shapes the figures and enhances the stylized drapery, adding dynamic patterns to the surface. Neither painting is better than the other. They simply use different visual strategies. The Church of St. Anthony includes both images, the images of 1232-1233, as seen on the upper left, and also a group of almost contemporary paintings in a completely different stylistic mode, shown here on the lower right. These depictions, about 50 years or so later in date, are, are located in the vault of a special space located between the nave and the sanctuary called the Hurus. They comprise both figural representations and also an extraordinary array of ornamental motifs. Windows, some with colored glass, were all closed up at the start of the conservation project, but enough original fragments remained that it was possible to recreate the panes. So there are clear glass roundels here at the bases on either side, and then running down the top center are some colored panes. From the top of the archway leading into the Hurus, the enormous and compelling archangels Michael and Gabriel gaze down at the viewer. On the eastern wall of the Hurus, framing the top of the arch leading into the sanctuary, are two scenes from the Gospels, the women at the tomb shown on the right and the women in the garden on the left. As seen with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the narrative is organized right to left. So here are the three women. Here's the angel seated on the stone. This actually is a now discolored um, representation of the opening into the tomb with the, the shroud. Um, the, the white that was used here has turned red in the, in the heat of the sun. And then on the left are the women in the garden encountering Christ. In style and iconography, these figural paintings were created by at least two artists trained in the Byzantine tradition, as the similarities between these depictions of the Mother of God illustrate. The St. Anthony figure is shown on the left, and a middle Byzantine icon of the Mother of God is on the right. The ornamental elements in this Horus area take us into another world altogether. Multiple and varied bands fill the arched ceiling. And a fantastic arabesque occupies the western wall opposite the tomb of Christ. So these are the archangels whom we saw a few, a few slides ago, and I'm referring to this, which is facing the, the paintings we just looked at of the tomb of Christ. Numerous parallels for these decorative strategies exist in Cairo. One example is shown here on the left from the 1296 CE minbar of the Mamluk Sultan Lejeune in the mosque of Ibn Tulun. Another is one of the circa 1300 CE carved wooden panels from a door in the hanging church in Old Cairo, now in the British Museum. The tradition in which this richly ornamented ceiling stands is that of palatial spaces in the Islamic world, such as the circa 1310 CE example in the Ka'a of Ahmad Kuya in Cairo, shown on the right. The deployment of Arabic inscriptions seen in the bottom zone of the St. Anthony ceiling on the left, and stylistic elements that we have traditionally associated with Muslim visual culture is actually not surprising. Jewish, Christian, and Muslim artisans worked in Cairo, all worked in Cairo, and were in close touch with each other. Religious buildings from all three faiths used these ornamental elements, which should not actually be seen as Islamic, but rather as the most current fashion of the day. Multiple styles, in fact, were available in medieval Egypt, some local and others imported by Syrian and Armenian artists. Within this context, the Hurus ceiling ornament makes the space palatial. Its location high above its monastic viewers and the inscriptions in Arabic and Coptic indicate that the palace in question is a heavenly one. The texts make reference to the courts, dwellings, and house of the Lord. So the Coptic inscriptions are here at the base and along the inner edge of this arch, and you can see one of the uh, Arabic ones there. In closing, I will return to Shanuta's monastery again, 
But this time, the extraordinary work we'll be looking at is medieval in date, and it intrigued me for well over a decade before conservation. It is painted on a pier to the south side of the central lobe in the White Monastery Church Sanctuary. And I'm grateful to my colleague and friend Stephen Davis for funding its conservation, and to Luigi de Cesaris, Alberto Succato, and Emiliano Ricci for undertaking the work. Here is a first indication of the power of the image revealed from underneath layers of soot. <clears throat> so uh, there are very thin lines as in part of the eye area here, in the area under the eye that was missing. It's called the tritegio technique. So the conservators, uh, because this is a devotional image in a living Coptic monastery, filled it in to look like the painting was whole from a distance. But when you get up close, you can actually see some of the, the, you can see the little lines and you can tell precisely what was added and what was not. And this is the painting post-conservation. The Virgin's total frontality and symmetrical pose, holding an oval clipeus or heavenly field, enclosing the child and staring straight out at the viewer with large eyes, make her seem statue-like, but also intensely present. A series of circles and partial circles transfix the viewer. A red half circle behind the throne frames the perfectly round, heavily outlined halo surrounding Mary's enormous round maphorion covered head, which in turn inscribes the circle of her face. Her domed brows and large round pupils continue the visual sequence, as do two smaller circles containing monograms that hover on either side of her. The stars on the back of her throne have round centers that, on a smaller scale, also echo the circle of Mary's face, framed by the jagged internal profile of her head covering. Christ's smaller head and halo sent, set against the bright red clopeus continue the hypnotic grouping of shapes. While the intensity of the gazes and the heavy outlining are clearly within the long-standing medieval tradition of painting, the star pattern on the back of the throne enables us to date this image to the early 14th century. A painted linen shroud of the Archangel Michael, said to have come from the general region of the White Monastery Federation, has close stylistic parallels to the painting of the Virgin. I cannot overemphasize how extraordinary its survival is. So, painted linen. The textile bears an inscription dating it to Anno Martyrorum 1044, which corresponds to 1327, 1328 CE. The basket weave star pattern on the angel's robes is similar to that on the back of the Virgin's throne. It's hard to see, but hopefully you can make out this star here, which is somewhat better preserved and observe its similarity to the one on the left and the painting on the left. <clears throat> the circular rendering of the faces is also quite similar with large pupils, sweeping brows, outlined noses, and small pursed lips above semicircles representing the chins. While the damaged state of the textile makes it impossible to say this with certainty, it seems very likely to me that the same hand painted both images. This is the last datable monument that still survives from early Byzantine and medieval Christian Egypt. It stands at the end of a rich and multifaceted tradition that lasted for at least a thousand years. Frequent outbreaks of plague and discriminatory measures inflicted on the Copts in the 14th century by Muslims reduced the Christian population considerably and ended the medieval golden age. The Copts constitute a significant percentage of the population of Egypt today and have a flourishing diaspora. They are the single largest Christian group in the Middle East. So as I see it, there are two stories here. One of Coptic resilience in the face of oppression, but also another one of overall tolerance on the part of their Muslim rulers for well over a millennium. Thanks to the wonderful state of preservation of their cultural heritage, and in the aftermath of major conservation projects, Christians in Egypt are able, again, once again, to pray in their historical churches. Throughout the centuries, they have contributed to the vibrant cultural richness of Africa's Christian tradition. Thank you very much.
I think I speak for all of us when I say that was just truly amazing. So thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we now take a turn to the south, so I understand. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Alexandros Tsakos, who earned his PhD from the Humboldt University in Berlin. He's worked as an archeologist in Greece, Syria, and Sudan, and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bergen, working on a research project entitled Religious Literacy in Christian Nubia. And the title of his talk today is Christian Nubia, the Literacy and Beliefs of an Afro-Byzantine Theocracy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tsatsakos. Let me begin by thanking myself to the organizers for the invitation to contribute to uh, this very important academic venue with a talk about Christian Nubia as an Afro-Byzantine uh, theocracy. It would of course be impossible uh, to discuss all aspects of Christianity in Nubia or of the medieval Sudanese states uh, in a short presentation. So in order to define the character of Christian Nubia in the terms announced with the title of my talk, I decided to focus on two things. First, the choice of creeds used among Nubians during the medieval era. And second, the process of Christianization in the Middle Nile region. Some general introductory remarks are however necessary and I'd like to begin by commenting upon the title of our panel, namely the churches of Philip and Mark, the Christian Nile. By Christian Nile, our hosts obviously mean Coptic Egypt and Christian Nubia, the latter being what can be identified geographically with the Middle Nile region. The Middle Nile region is a stretch of the Nile between Khartoum and Aswan, where the river passes through a series of at least six rapids called cataracts. For various reasons, the area of the second cataract divides Nubia in upper and lower Nubia. The geomorphology of the second cataract region sets a barrier, since beyond that point, it becomes exceedingly difficult to navigate upstream. Therefore, Lower Nubia can be seen both geographically and historically as more linked with Egypt and thus with the Mediterranean world than Upper Nubia, which seems a bit cut off from the north. Now, Nubia is a broader term including beyond geography and history, people and their language. The Nubians are people whose native language belongs to the Nubian family within the northeastern Sudanic subgroup of the Nilo Saharan phylum. Although traces of their language family can be found in the Nile Valley from the Pharaonic era already, their origins seem to be located west of the Nile and in regions as far away as Kordofan and Darfur, until circa the fourth century CE, when they take advantage of the collapse of the Meroitic Empire, the, the last state formation of ancient Sudan known as Kush, and gradually gain the control of the Middle Nile region. Thus begins the millennium of the Nubian Middle Ages, an era that may be identified with a period that this region was ruled by three Christian kingdoms. First, the territory between the first and the third cataracts belonged to the kingdom of Nobadia with its capital at Faras or Kasribrin. Second, Upper Nubia between the third cataract and a point between the fifth cataract and the junction of the Nile with the river Atpara was the territory of the kingdom of Makuria with its capital at Old Dongola. At some point in the seventh century, Makuria annexed Nobadia and Nobadia was ruled by an eparch of the Makuritan king. Third, to the south of Makuria until an unknown point in central Sudan, the area south of the junctions of the Blue and White Niles at Khartoum, stretched the kingdom of Alwa with its capital most probably at Soba. Between Alwa and Makuria, there appears in the Arabic sources relating events of the final phases of the Middle Ages, a fourth kingdom called Alabwab, which means in Arabic, the doors. Leaving aside Alabwab, which is an Arabic term for an obscure state formation in late, antique, in, in late medieval Nubia, 
it is worthwhile underlining that Alwa seems to be a Nubian name deriving from the word Aru for rain, since Alwa lies in latitudes where it rains indeed, in contrast with the rest of the Middle Nile, which is one of the most arid regions in the world. While Nobaidia and Makuria have different names in Nubian language, Migit and Dotawa, respectively. Nubia was indeed a multilingual society, where apart from the local tongue, the written form of which is called Old Nubian, Greek and Coptic were also widely used, while certainly Arabic was at periods influential. We also know that Syriac was learned in some literate circles. So Christian Nubia, as a term including all these state formations, is what has been here suggested as the Church of Philip. This ascription to Philip, however, is what we call today an urban myth. So how did Nubia come to be associated with Philip the Evangelist, who was often confused with Philip the Apostle? This is due to the famous passage from Acts 8, 26, 40, where Philip is asked by the angel of God to travel to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Gaza. In that deserted road, he met a eunuch, servant of the queen of Ethiopia that had traveled to Jerusalem to worship and was on his return trip back home. Philip saw the, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch reading Isaiah and educated him in the correct understanding of the scriptures as prophetic for the Christian revelation. Thus, that eunuch became the first Christian Ethiopian and there began the history of the church of Philip in Africa. The reference to Ethiopians in Jerusalem may appear as fitting with the narratives about the Queen of Sheba and Solomon and the presence of Jews in Ethiopia. The term Ethiopia, however, did not refer in ancient times to the country that is today Ethiopia. Rather, it meant the land of the people whose faces are dark as if from coal and was used for the land south of Egypt more generally. These caused confusions that also affected the passage from the Acts. Let's have a closer look at the Greek texts. Keidou anir Ethiops evnuchos dynastis kandakis tis basilisis Ethiopo. The term used to describe the queen of the Ethiopians is kandake, and this is a meroitic word used for woman in the royal family of Kush. I clarify that meroitic is the language of the last of the three great ancient Sudanese kingdoms that were known under the name Kush. So which country did the author of the Acts mean? In my opinion, none, or perhaps both. <laughs> for there is no other evidence for the arrival of Christianity to either Nubia or Aksum in the first century CE, although we cannot, of course, exclude that individuals from those countries did have contacts with a new religion and perhaps became adherents to the faith in Jesus Christ, his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection for the salvation of the humans. But such a personal conversion has not constituted a turning point for the history of either Aksum or Meroe, which continued for three more centuries practicing their traditional pagan religion. Rather, the explanation for the history with Philip and Candace's eunuch should be seen on the one hand as part of the effort by the early Christians to link every corner of the earth with the missionary activity of the apostles, and on the other hand as a way to use the knowledge about Ethiopia that the author of the Acts would have access to in order to make his narrative believable for his readers. Moreover, this mythical ascription of the origins of the Christian religion in a given region to the missionary activity of an apostle or of another prominent figure of the apostolic era is only one of the ways that the Christian church used in order to legitimize its historical roots in that region. The expanding church attempted to do that in various ways. One was by agreeing upon the doctrinal lim limitations of its object of faith, what we call a creed. Another was by choosing a canon of texts that carried the only possible historic truth about the foundation of the religion. Further texts defined the patristic tradition and the cultic patterns in the liturgy. A last sine qua non was moreover necessary. 
the church and the church fathers who decide upon the mythologies and the historiographies which legitimize or render heretical a local tradition or a general belief need a guarantor on the ground. And that guarantor has more often than not been a state formation that chose Christianity as its official religion, be that the Armenian kingdom or the Roman Empire, the most renowned political framework for the second Abrahamic religion. It was inside the frame of especially the Eastern Roman Empire that Nubian Christianity was also born. The way it developed was a result of the socio-political context of the Nubian kingdoms in which it was practiced. And the adoption, rejection, or creation of new ideas about the faith, the canon, and the liturgy. From this variety of sources, the creeds in Nubia offer, in my opinion, the best evidence to enhance our understanding of the religious character of Nubian Christianity. In combination with the way the Middle Nile region was Christianized, I believe that we will manage by the end of my talk to see that the term Afro-Byzantine theocracy is well fitted to describe Christian Nubia. So the first time that the creed was identified among the textual record discovered in Christian Nubia was in the so-called Anchorite's Grotto in the far of, uh, top of the slide, right between Faras on the left and the nearby monastery at Castrelwiz to the right. So on the walls of this grotto, a monk called Theophilos had retreated and in 738 Anno Domini, he completed the decoration of the walls of his cell, which are fully covered with texts of mainly apotropaic nature. Among these texts, framed as if to give the impression of a manuscript folio, Theophilus had written in Sahidic Coptic the creed of faith that described his belief and dogmatic appurtenance. This was the Nicene Creed, which was formulated by the Council of Nicaea in 325, so as to anathematize the Arian heresy and function as a test for bishops whose orthodoxy needed to be checked. The text of the Nicene Creed is based in pre-existing baptismal creeds, elaborates on the essence of the Son God, is very short in its reference to the Holy Spirit, and closes with anathematisms referring to specific Arian aberrations. The reference to the Nicene Creed in the early church point to the direction that it was used with threat of punishment in case any other creeds substituted it until the Council of Chalcedon in 431. Then another creed took the Nicene Creed place, one that was assigned to the Council of Constantinople of 381 CE. The latter substituted the anathematisms of the end of the Nicene Creed with an expanded statement about the nature of the Holy Spirit and references to the expectations for afterlife guaranteed by adherence to the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. In post-Chalcedonian times, when the world of Eastern Christianity was split between pro and contra Chalcedonians, the adherence to the Nicene Creed underlined the wish to differentiate one's faith from the pro-Chalcedonian Christians. The difference between the two doctrines was related to the choice between a single and double nature for the Christ. The Council of Chalcedon stated that the Orthodox faith recognized the double nature of Christ, that is both divine and human, while the contra Chalcedonians insisted that Christ's nature was exclusively divine. Therefore, Theophilos of the grotto between Faras and Castrel Wies can be seen as someone insisting in post-Chalcedonian times, not to use the Constantinopolitan creed, but to claim his adherence to the contra Chalcedonians by stating his faith in the form of the Nicene Creed. When this discovery was made, and this explanation for the choice of the creed was first proposed, it appeared as the most natural thing, since the belief had been that Christian Nubia was monophysite, as it was wrongly called back then. The reasons for this belief were on the one hand, the cultural, social, and economic dependence of Lower Nubia from Egypt, at least until the 7th century CE, but also the reference in Copto-Arabic sources that the Nubian church was subordinated hierarchically to the Coptic Patriarchate, one of the two major poles of support of the contra-Chalcedonian dogma, 
the other one being, of course, Syria. And on the other hand, the narratives about the evangelization of Nubia from Byzantium, to which, to which we will return shortly. Before that, though, there is quite more to say about the textual record for the creed of faith from Nubia. Another creed was identified two years ago when Professor Adam Waiter from the University of Warsaw and myself began the study of the manuscripts discovered at Faras by the Polish mission that worked there in the 1960s in the frame of the Aswan Haidam campaigns. Soon after, I identified in five different fragments a new creed of, fa of faith written in Greek and dated on paleographic grounds around the 11th, 12th centuries. This time, however, the creed was not that the one of Nicaea. It was much closer to the one called the Constantinopolitan Creed, but with two exceptions. First, in the part that the text followed the creed's textus receptus, it did not copy faithfully all the details, but it deviated in manners that are representative of the way Greek was used in Christian Nubia. I would need another lecture to cover this amazing topic, but suffice it to say here that there are always many mistakes in cases, persons, genders, numbers, verb endings, etc., more likely to be explained by characteristics of the old Nubian language itself, like the absence of genders or the use of the same morpheme for the second and third person singular of the verb forms. The second deviation from the Constantinopolitan creed was more interesting in terms of content. The section stating the belief in the nature of Christ is definitely much longer than the other known creeds. Unfortunately, this particular part of the creed was written between the end of the recto and the beginning of the verso, and these lines are typically lost today. Luckily, though, our colleagues from Poland have discovered further witnesses of the use of a creed of faith, and one of those can fill the papyrological vacant. The site of the discovery was this time the Makuritan capital of old Dongola. Among the very rich finds of texts on walls of religious and secular buildings, Adam Waiter identified two more instances of the creed. In one case, the text was identical to the Constantinopolitan creed, but in the other, the text was very different. And the greatest difference was precisely the inclusion of a rather long narrative narrative referring to the nature and life of Jesus. More specifically, after the reference to the Christ being born by Mary, the text reads, who fled to Egypt through Herod and was led into temptation through the devil, who was baptized by John and was sold by Judas, who was examined and interrogated by Pilate and was mocked by the Jews, who was, text missing, a nail to the cross, text missing, and was buried and rose again on the third day, who sits on the right hand of the Father and judges living and dead. Later on, Waiter identified this text also in a manuscript, this time from the lower Nubian site of Jebel Adda, but he, was, but he had already very fittingly called this creed of faith Symbolum Dongolanum. So, returning to the vacant in the Faras manuscript, where both the last preserved section on the recto and the first preserved section on the verso are about Jesus, it is tempting to suggest that this longer narrative on the life of Jesus from the Symbolum Dongolanum is what was there in the so-called Faras Creed. Therefore, I suggest that in Nubia, there are at least four different texts of the creed used. The Nicene Creed, the Constantinopolitan Creed, the Symbolum Dongolanum, and a combination of the last two. If we'd like to attempt a reconstruction of the place of the different creeds in the frame of the Nubian church, we would have to accept that there was a difference between the role of contra-Calcedonian Christianity among Nubians of Nobadia and the way Nubian Christianity developed after the Makuritan annexation of Lower Nubia. In other words, in contrast to what we apprehend from the creed written on the wall of the Anchorite's grotto, the Makuritans do not seem to insist in contra-Calcedonian convictions. Furthermore, they appear at ease with accepting developments in the subsequent centuries, since they also used the Constantinopolitan creed, which had become prevalent from quite early in the Middle Ages among contra-Calcedonians too. It remains, however, puzzling. What is the role of the Symbolum Dongolanum inside Nubian Christianity? 
And why would someone in finance combine the two creeds? Two things stand out, in my opinion, as important here. On the one hand, Nubian Christianity shows a variety of forms of faith and cult practice. It is, however, difficult to know whether this is evidence of religious tolerance or of a variety in liturgical patterns where, for example, one creed might have been used in a Eucharistic context, another in a baptismal one, and a third for the celebration of the hours. On the other hand, the church at Old Dongola attempted to create an indigenous form of Christian faith and cult practice. Further evidence to support this idea can be found in the institution of the office of an archbishop based at Old Dongola, and not mentioned in the list of ecclesiastics subordinate to the Coptic Patriarch in the Egyptian sources I mentioned earlier, as well as in the very recent find of another wall inscription from Old Dongola commemorating a local synod assembling at Old Dongola under the archbishop all the bishops that are known from specifically these lists. For the time being, I do not think that it is possible to place a verdict on any one of these two options, and perhaps it is not necessary since they may have functioned complementarily. I believe, however, that this distancing of Makuritan Christianity from contra calcedonian patterns can be further nuanced, and in order to do that, I will now turn to the process of Christianization beginning with evangelization of Nubia in the sixth century. The region of Nobadia was closest to Egypt and therefore seems to have received the Christian faith earlier than the rest of Nubia. Itinerant monks from Egypt first introduced a new religion to the Nobadians, as can be seen from references in the histories of the monks of Upper Egypt by Paphnutius and the homily by Shenute, as we began to preach, where Blemis and Nubians appear amongst those present in his monastery, albeit not yet converted. Archaeological evidence from the monastic site at Castro el Wiz, next to the capital city of Faras, confirms the important role of the Shenutian milieu, as well as the links with other ascetic circles in Egypt too. It is important that the establishment of a church at the site has been fixed to a date already from the 6th, if not from the 5th century CE. In the same period, the gradual change of funerary customs in Lower Nubia, i.e. extended position in graves oriented east-west with no burial furnishing, confirmed the early conversion of the population inhabiting Lower Nubia to the Christian faith. Sometime between 538 and 548 CE, that is during the reign of Justinian and Theodora, Byzantine missionaries appeared in Obedia too. Against the background I sketched, their activity should be rather seen as an act of sealing the close relationship between at least Lower Nubia and the Christian Roman Empire, but always in the context of the Chalcedonian crisis. It should be noted that this missionary activity is narrated in the church history composed in Syriac by John of Ephesus, a contemporary of the events and supporter of the contra calcedonian party. John of Ephesus witnesses, however, both a contra calcedonian mission sent by Theodora and led by a priest called Julianus who converted the Nobadian court and a pro calcedonian mission sent by Justinian about which we only hear that they failed to gain a foothold in Obedia. The withdrawal of Julianus after some years left the Christianization process at a limbo. The congregation was left under the auspices of the Bishop of Philae Theodoros but there was no real organization of the church in place yet. So under Justin II, a second missionary was sent to Nobadia with a goal precisely to organize the church. His name was Longinus, and he became allegedly the first bishop of Nobadia. In the context of Longinus' activities, however, we also gained the best insight into the progress of the Christianization of the rest of Nubia, because as he, he, he reported in his correspondence that is preserved by John of Ephesus, he received an invitation from the king of Alwa to bring the gospel to his kingdom too. So Longinus traveled to Soba, where he found Christians of the Afartodokitist dogma coming from Aksum. Monumental epigraphy confirms that Aksumites 
had invaded the Meroitic heartlands and exercised some control, if not over the region, at least over the regional trade networks, as was often the case with the international political agenda of the Aksumite Empire. Longinus' trip there was not without trouble, however. And this was because of the satanic envy of those who dwelled between Nobadia and Alua, namely the Makuritans. The Makuritan effort to stop the missionary activity of reaching Alua may be linked with their wish to stop an alliance that will squeeze them out of regional and international networks. But at the same time, can be understood in religious terms, since the expression satanic envy is used el elsewhere by John of Ephesus to describe either pagans or Christians belonging to a different dogma than the one that he supports. So how can this be contextualized in the frame of religious controversies of the time? The answer can be, we have to give further agency to the mission sent by Justinian and supporting the Chalcedonian dogma. The members of such a mission could not just return to Constantinople empty-handed. Rather, we can see them bypassing Nobadia, reaching Makuria, and converting the local kings. With Nobadia subordinate to Egypt, and Alwa turned first towards Ethiopia, then perhaps towards Egypt too through alliance with Nobadia, Makuria was the perfect ally for the Byzantine Empire and the pro calcedonians The Christianization of the rest of the Makuritan territory, including the implications from the annexation of Nobadia in the early seventh century, was a more long-lasting project that occupied the Makuritan kings at least until the eighth century for the most upstream regions. What is important for the purpose of my talk today is that the outcome of this conversion from Chalcedonian, let's call it Melkite Byzantium, can be seen in the institutions and identities in the Makuritan kingdom, which adopted Byzantine nomenclature and structures. So in the last part of my talk, I wish to turn to some concrete examples from the state organization and ideology, the arts and its symbolism, and the international profile of Makuria in order to conclude with a sort of a demonstration of the idea that I put forward in the title of my presentation. A good example of the way Makuritan institutions were reflecting Byzantine ones can be found in the names for offices and titles at the court as analyzed by the late professor at the University of Bergen and one of the four editors of the Fontes Historia Nubiorum, Thomas Hegg. Hegg showed that the titles used by the Nubians derived from Byzantine nomenclature dating before the Islamic conquest of Egypt, and that this nomenclature was kept with respect through the millennium of Christian Nubian civilization, of course with the addition of local terms, but also with the creation of new titles coined on original Byzantine terms, like the impossible proto-misoteros. Archaeology has also provided good evidence to support the Byzantine character of the Makuritan identity. I'm referring to the most renowned archaeological output from Nubia, the mural paintings decorating the churches discovered at many sites along the Middle Nile. The leading figure in the studies of the iconographic program in the Nubian churches, Dobrochnas Jelinska from Warsaw again, has also shown how the early art of Makuria is so much inspired by Byzantine prototypes, preserved mainly in places like Ravenna and Thessaloniki, of course. And contrary to early Nobadian, which is definitely turned towards Coptic church decoration. The examples shown illustrate the differences for the earlier periods, while from the 8th century, a common artistic language is being created, also as a result of the annexation of Nobadia by Makuria. What Dobrochna has also showed us is that the iconographic program in the Nubian churches is an indigenous creation based on the clockwise arrangement of the feasts on the walls of the ales starting from the southern sacristy. In this arrangement, the feasts that do not conform with what we know of the festal calendar of the Coptic, Ethiopic, Byzantine, and Syrian churches should be considered, in my opinion, a Nubian innovation. And they are probably evidence for the existence of a Nubian Synaxarion. Apparently, in this local Synaxarion, local bishops were also venerated but the conditions and form of this cult eludes us still. Another innovation in the Nubian iconographic program is that after the ninth century, the central position in the apse decoration, which was dedicated to the Virgin and the Child 
flanked by two rows of apostles, is now taken up by the king under the protection of the virgin not holding the child. The integration of the royal figure in the most sacred position in the church is an illustration of the sacred aura with which the royal authority was invested in medieval Nubia. Here, we must also stress another major characteristic of the Christian faith among Nubians, the Mariola tree. The image of the virgin was highly venerated and in the Nubian context, this had beyond the obvious theological reasons, a very political reason too. It has been suggested, both for the ancient and for the medieval kingdoms of Sudan, that the succession was guaranteed through the female line of family. In other words, it was the reigning, reigning king's sister's son who would succeed him on the throne. And therefore, the role of the queen mother was crucial and thus a parallelization with the image of the Virgin Mary, very important to underline. This intrusion of the church space by the political realities is not without precedent. Sacred monarchies appear in many ancient and medieval societies, and until today, the emperor in Japan and the king in Thailand are two royal figures that have escaped the rationalization that the political sphere has gone through in the era after enlightenment. We are approaching the, the suggestion about theocracy for the political system in medieval Nubia. But in order to substantiate it further, we would need to find evidence that not only the king was seen as divine, but that all authority in the state was somehow deriving from God. Indeed, evidence has accumulated that in Nubia, there were major overlaps between the secular and the religious spheres beyond the royal figures. Perhaps the most characteristic evidence derives from the authority in the state apparatus of church officials. The Nubians had a tradition of writing up legal documents, usually on leather sheets, where we can notice two very interesting details. First, those who guarantee the validity of the documents are both state and church officials without any particular priority given to the ones over the others while there are even a couple of attestations of a member of the clergy or a monk who has assumed secular offices, like a notary or an admiral. And second, the scribes who compose these documents act in the name of the king, but guarantee the respect of their work by invoking religious powers that set their crafts midway between the argumentative and magical persuasion as has been shown by Giovanni in his book on medieval Nubian social and economic history from 2012. Moreover, in at least one case, legal documents were discovered inside the church at the upstream peripheries of the Makuritan kingdom. These doc documents were discovered together with manuscript fragments of religious literature, the Bible and works used in the liturgy in a room behind the apse of the church on the island of Sur in the fourth cataract region. I studied this material for my doctoral thesis and I have argued there that this coexistence of religious and documentary manuscripts makes it very probable that the priests officiating on Sur were representing the royal authority and the state institution. Obviously, in Makuria, the political authority was complementary with the religious authority which was again guaranteed by, on the one hand, a centralized institution based at Old Dongola, king and archbishop, and on the other hand, by the idea that those with access to the divine order expressed through religious texts and state documents were to be respected as the voice of both the king and God. I feel I owe a last little bit of information added so as to have the picture that I'm drawing completed. I would like to show you evidence of the element Afro in my suggestion for an Afro-Byzantine theocracy. And although a variety of archaeological finds could be brought in the discussion of, as arguments supporting the suggestion, today I will use only the example of a unique mural painting discovered in Dongola and a remarkable narrative about a Dongolese king recorded in the history of the Coptic Patriarchate. The mural painting was found in an annex of a monastery at the Makuritan capital, and it speaks for itself, as it illustrates so eloquently the African character of some of the rituals performed the frame of Nubian Christianity, perhaps in or around the monastery, 
and surely in connection with the dynastic issues at Dongola, since the dance shown here is related with fertility cult around the person of Mary. And with this image before your eyes, let me finish up with a story of an invasion of Egypt in the 8th century by a large Nubian army led by the king of Nubia, Kyriakos, as a retaliation for the imprisonment of the Coptic patriarch Michael I by the emir of Egypt, Abdel Malik ibn Musa. The best analysis of the sources witnessing this story can be found in an excellent article by our friend and colleague, Robin Signobos. So we learned from Robin that the first time this event was narrated was in the life of Patriarch Michael I himself. This work was composed in the second half of the 8th century and was thus an almost contemporary witness. However, we know of this narrative only through the Arabic work known as the History of the Patriarchs of Alexandria that you've been hearing about these two days, composed originally between the 11th and the 12th centuries. There, the Nubian king is praised as a supporter of the Copts, Copts and is called, and I quote, King of Ethiopia, Orthodox, King who rules over the southern confines of the earth, fourth king on earth, end of quote. The first term is perhaps a repetition of the confusion between present day Ethiopia and Nubia that we also saw in the analysis of the episode with Apostle Philip in the Acts, but this time based on a similar confusion with the Arabic term Habasha. Thus, the rule south of Egypt equals with the rule over the southern confines, either these are the Middle Nile region or the Ethiopian highlands. Kyriakos title as the fourth king on earth is following a pattern for the main persons in the entire life of the Patriarch Michael, namely that they are identified with biblical figures, and this fourth king derives from the prophecies of Daniel. As for the term, term orthodox, in the frame of the history of the Coptic patriarchs, it can only mean an adherence to the same doctrines as in Egypt. But to what degree this was a pertinent claim for the lived experience of Christianity inside Dotao, I have already raised my doubts, and I think Giovanni will have more to say in a very short while. In any case, there was a second compilation of the work History of the Patriarchs of Alexandria, which was completed in the 13th century. There, King Kyriakos is identified as, and I quote, Orthodox Ethiopian King of the Makuritans, great king upon whom the crown of heavens has descended, and he rules over the southern confines of the earth because he is the Greek king, fourth among the kings of the earth. End of quote. The new titles and honors in this version clarify some points of the earlier text and expand on the encomium for the Nubian king. His roles as great king upon whom the crown of heavens has descended and as Greek king or king of the room are in line with apocalyptic traditions of both the Syrian and the Egyptian worlds, traditions that place the hopes for liberation of the Christian population of the East who are subordinated to the caliphate, caliphate to the power of the Greek king and of the Ethiopian king. Obviously, for the Egyptian Christians, the Nubian king was the personification of both these apocalyptic royal figures. As for the Nubians, this belief was exploited by profiling, profiling Makuritan monarchy, both inside the Nubian realm and in the uh, regional and international arenas, as an Afro-Byzantine theocracy. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexandros. Um, we started this session late, so I assume we're going to go past one. But to give uh, our third and final presenter time, I'm going to introduce him straight away. That is Giovanni Ruffini, professor of classical studies in the Department of History at Fairfield University to our south in Connecticut. He's the director of Fairfield's classical studies program and co-director of its honors program. And he'll be speaking to us today on the theme of Nubia, Christianity without church or theology. Thank you, Giovanni.
start slideshow from the beginning. Okay, and that is going to be. Right up there. There's slideshow. Ah, I see. Did you left click? Oh, there you are. Good. All right, thanks. The title of my talk is deliberately polemical. Nubian Christianity without church or theology, this is not really my position. I mean it only as a rhetorical tool to argue by opposites, to highlight certain characteristics, and in doing so, to draw what I think is a deliberate contrast with the image of Nubian Christianity appearing elsewhere in the scholarly literature. A standard approach to Nubian Christianity speaks of a Byzantine church with Monophysite theology. My friend Alexandros took a more nuanced approach in his talk with you here today, but I think he would agree when I say that a presumption of Nubian monophysitism has dominated the field. I find it more useful to draw attention to other aspects of Nubian Christianity, aspects that I think are more fundamentally personal and protective. These aspects are in no way unique to Nubian Christianity, but they do show ways in which Nubia takes Christianity and adapts it, indigenizes it, and makes it its own. To highlight this aspect of Nubian Christianity, I will present a small handful of texts excavated at various sites throughout Christian Nubia. Now, I make no claim about the typicality of these texts. To a certain degree, texts in a semi-literate society are by definition going to be atypical. Indeed, it will be clear that one or two of these texts are certainly exceptional. Rather, I present these texts with an eye towards the connections they reveal, connections between Nubia and Roman late antiquity, between Nubia and Northeastern African Christianity more generally, between Nubia and pre-Christian traditions of the ancient Near East, and between Nubia and the medieval travelers of Western Europe. These connections are intrinsically interesting in their own right, but they are also interesting for the degree to which they show Nubian Christians in action, taking foreign aspects of Christianity and altering them in certain ways, putting them to slightly different uses. Now, I, I must preemptively apologize for the decidedly unsexy nature of my PowerPoints compared to some of the beautiful images we've seen so far today. I only wish to show you a small handful of texts, and unfortunately, as you can see here, we don't even have photographs of the originals of all these texts. Here, we're looking at a tracing of one of these texts that was made uh, before the text itself was re-lost after excavation. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. The Nubian version of St. Sassinius. The unpublished text in question comes from the excavations at Kazarabrim. Kazarabrim is one of the crown jewels of Nubian archaeology. It's a site that was continuously inhabited from antiquity to the 1800s AD. Excavations begun throughout northern Nubia in the 1960s in anticipation of the rising waters of Lake Nasser continued far longer at Kazarabrim because the site sat on top of a hill. These digs uncovered hundreds of texts from Christian Nubia, including this amulet telling the story of St. Sicinios. The text is in Greek, but Greek, frankly, so bad that the story would be almost unintelligible if it were not so widely known from other sources around the Mediterranean. In format, the amulet is like many others from Christian Nubia. It begins with an invocation of the Trinity and ends with the name of the person seeking protection. In this case, your servant Meju, daughter of Titiko, followed by cryptograms and abbreviations invoking the archangels Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. The body of the text tells the story of Saint Sicinios himself. This protective figure has deep roots in the religious tradition of the Eastern Mediterranean, making its first appearance in West Semitic sources in the 7th century BC on a Phoenician amulet. In dozens of versions throughout the Mediterranean into the early modern era, Sicinios is a warrior who protects babies against kidnapping demons. The Nubian version of the Sicinios story is squarely within this tradition, but introduces its own variants. The antagonist in the story is a baby-killing nemesis named Belsalea, which I think you can compare to the names Alabastrea and Wetzelia 
known from the Coptic and Ethiopic versions, respectively. This nemesis kills Sicinios' grandson, his daughter's newborn child. Sicinios, riding a white horse, heads off in search of her, finally here tracking her down at rest in a vineyard where she is communing with the powers of darkness. The imagery of our antagonist riding off to battle evil seems to me to parallel the imagery of several of the military saints whose cults are, were also popular in Christian Nubia, Georgios and Mercurios in particular. The presence of Sicinios in Nubia, the presence of an exemplar of a tradition reaching from Ethiopia to Russia, from the Middle East to Western Europe, I think is itself inherently satisfying proof, if any were really needed, of Nubia's place in the broader family tree of Christianity. A and yet, when I look at this amulet, I cannot help but wonder if something has actually gone wrong. When Sicinios goes off in search of the enemy, he asks a woman whether he has seen her. Lege autes arate oresas ten basileon. Note that last, basileon. Not, have you seen Belsilea, but have you seen the queen? On the one hand, the usual crutch is at hand. We are looking at a scribal mistake. The scribe, confronted with an unusual proper name, quite close to a royal title, simply turned one into the other. The sense that the scribe does not quite understand his source material heightens when we get to the end of the text and actually nothing happens. Sicinios dismounts, he starts to speak, and then the story stops. On the other hand, I very much would like to give the scribe the benefit of the doubt and imagine a Nubian variation of the tradition in which the evildoer is a queen and Sicinios the queen slayer. In an Arabic synaxary based on a Coptic original, Saint Sicinios is actually a member of Diocletian's court. So maybe the nemesis in the Nubian version is some version of the imperial family. And as in the Arabic Synaxary, Sicinios is part of Diocletian's court circle. The nemesis in the Ethiopic version, Wetzalea, has indeed been suggested as a distortion of Basilea. If so, the Nubian Greek version of the story may be the closest thing that we have to a lost source for both the Arabic and the Ethiopic versions, which I think is another nice clue to Nubian Christianity's place in a broader family tree. Note also the complete absence of anything necessarily Christian at the core of the text. The opening and closing invocations aside, this could just as easily be a non-Christian text. The story needs no theology to serve its function. It is purely protective in purpose, as we see with so many other aspects of Nubian Christianity. The, the relative lack of what we might recognize as mainstream Christian theology continues as we move further south. Atiri is another one of those sites excavated in the 1960s through rescue operations during the rise of Lake Nasser, just south of the Nile's second cataract in this case. It was home to a small settlement in the late medieval period, although the bulk of the activity on the site was post-medieval. A series of old Nubian texts from the site, this is one of them, have recently been published through a collaborative of a handful of scholars, including the two speakers on Nubia today. Some of the texts are mere scraps, and some of them are simply documentary texts, sales, or letters that are much like those found from other Nubian sites. But to my mind, the two most important Atiri texts are, are invaluable evidence for the nature of Nubian Christianity. These texts appear to be part of a larger comp compilation of literary texts on the archangel Michael. Thus, they form part of a broader corpus of material demonstrating existence of a popular cult of Michael in medieval Nubia. This, in and of itself, is not particularly unusual. Much of the Michael material from Nubia has roots in Egyptian Christianity. Here, it seems that the Nubians take this tradition quite a bit further. Some of the claims about Michael in the Atiri texts are, to my mind, theologically eye-popping. And here I'm quoting our translation of these texts. Who, the text asks, bears conquered mankind? Well, he does. The archangel Michael, who gave power to God. 
It is he who overcomes the power hungry. It is he who liberated the enslaved. It is he who made abundant grain glow. This is, at least in my opinion, pretty deep into heterodox territory, if not completely untethered from Christian theology altogether. Who else in Orthodox Christianity liberates the enslaved and makes grain glow outside of the Trinity? And who indeed gives power to God? No one. While much of Nubia's veneration of Michael comes from external tradition, with these lines, we are at the heart of Nubian literary and theological innovation. The passages are in what appear to be a Nubian form of dodecasyllable, and each sentence rhymes. The likelihood, therefore, that this is an original Nubian composition seems exceedingly high. To put the matter another way, the medieval Nubian text that shows the greatest sign of originality is the one in its attitude towards the archangel Michael that shows the least sign of orthodoxy. This is an important point in part because of how derivative most of Nubia's Christian literature otherwise seems to be. Put more positively, Nubia's Christian literature is part of a larger corpus. Zooming in on one aspect of this corpus reveals, I think, another moment of borderline Nubian heterodoxy in regard to the archangels. The Christianity of northeastern Africa has inherited, if not in fact actively created, a considerable amount of unparalleled source material on Roman late antiquity. I think in particular of the Ethiopic manuscript tradition, which preserves a number of rich stories about members of the fourth and fifth century Theodosian dynasty, their friends, their relatives. On surviving evidence, medieval Ethiopia's literary output was several orders of magnitude larger than medieval Nubia's. Still, what little we have from medieval Nubia shows that the Ethiopian tradition of Roman hagiography was not unique to that region, but was rather part of a larger family tree of traditions that are now largely lost. So uh, in this context, I would like to mention an old Nubian homily on the archangel Raphael found at Khazar Ibrim and attributed to John Chrysostom. What survives of the old Nubian, as you can see, is fragmentary, but striking nonetheless. The emperor Honorius who reigned in the western half of the Roman Empire from 395 to 423 AD, plans to build a church to the archangel. The homily speaker, this is notionally John Chrysostom, preaches directly to Honorius on the merits of his plan. The surviving text dwells on the archangel's deeds. He saved the three holy ones from the furnace of fire. He gave power to the prophet Jeremiah he saved Peter and the martyrs from tribulation. One slightly damaged passage in this text seems to say that it is the archangel Raphael who did not make one nation greater than another. This is a remarkable statement of an archangel's power. I think it's similar to the powers that are given to the archangel Michael in the Atiri text. Indeed, Chrysostom tells Honorius that it is Raphael himself who will prepare for the emperor, quote, a seat in the kingdom of heavens. Neither God nor Jesus appear to be a factor, either on heaven or in earth. This text is, to be sure, based on an earlier Arabic exemplar, but it shows nonetheless a tendency I find throughout Nubian Christianity to downplay the Trinity and emphasize instead the protection and intercession of what would otherwise be secondary powers. I have mentioned a now lost family tree of Northeastern African traditions. Here I am shamelessly stealing a slide from Alexandros's presentation. We see this phenomenon in fascinating form uh, further south in Nubia, the capital city of Dongola and its funerary architecture. Dongola has been the object of Polish archaeological excavations for over 50 years. In 1993, this Polish mission uncovered an inscribed burial vault in an annex to a monastery on what they call Com H. At long last this year, the texts on the walls of this vault 
have received a proper addition and commentary by Adam Whitar and Jacques van der Vliet. The mortuary complex was the final resting place for Georgios, Archbishop of Dongola, from 1063 to 1113, and several other men, presumably also bishops of Dongola. The inscriptions, which predate Georgios' deposition in the vault, if they are not actually directly to his credit, I think are a fascinating testament to the prominent role of Mary in Nubian Christianity. Outside of the vault, above ground, you have a wide array of texts invoking Christ, the archangels, and a whole range of figures. But underground, in the vault itself, the focus is decidedly Marian. The text turns the crypt into a phylactery, written in the words of the Virgin herself, to offer protection against, quote, all magic and every attack and every plot of the adversary, unquote. Mary becomes the central character in this crypt, praying to and eventually ascending to join her son Jesus. But her words are not simply an abstraction. They have a physical effect on the space itself. In the words of the editors, quote, the scribe John states that by inscribing the burial vault, he transformed that very vault into a large-scale amulet that affords divine protection against generalized forms of danger or mishap with a view to resurrection, unquote. To be sure, there's nothing uniquely Nubian about Marian devotion generally or about the funerary texts centered on her that we find in this vault. The assemblage clearly draws from the so-called Coptic magic tradition. The Ethiopian Office of the Dead also offers clear parallels to these texts in the vault describing Mary's dormition. Again, Nubia has a place in an African textual family tree. Still, the crypt is part of a telling pattern that we see throughout Nubian Christianity. Christianity's specific function is to protect the Christian, quote, with a view to resurrection. But the vehicles giving that protection are not the body and blood of the living Christ, but Raphael, or Michael, or Mary. The Orthodox road to salvation is not in view replaced instead by the power of the phylactery. Now, having found the Virgin Mary deep in Nubia's central heartland, I want now to head back north to Khazar Ibrim, where Mary makes what is, to my mind, one of her strangest Nubian appearances. We have a piece of paper just over six lines long in a typical old Nubian hand, a text at first glance that is like any other old Nubian document. But it is an extremely puzzling text. It begins with an invocation to Santa Maria and ends after an invocation to Santa Simeon with the word Ayutami. In one study several years ago, I suggested that this last word should be read as Italian which is a preposterous idea if it were not for a recent find of a Nubian graffito in Provençal. The paleography of this text is undeniably Old Nubian, and apparent Old Nubian grammatical features, such as the objective case ending ka, and potential verbal endings na, ari, and ira. But you have several other features that are clearly not Old Nubian in this text. Four words in this text begin with the letter N, which is something that Old Nubian just does not do. And if you can read this, not all of you will be able to, I apologize, you will be able to see the recurring sounds in the text. Kaka, naka, usta, ustata, ayusata, nume, mamume, putche, futche, and my personal favorite, numana, thumana. This is an almost lyrical quality to the text that elevates my doubts about its intelligibility. Equally troubling are the kaka and naka, which are both suggestive of the Nubian third person directive case taka. This text might almost be the product of someone unfamiliar with old Nubian trying to transcribe the old Nubian he heard but could not understand. 
Terry Wilfong once drew attention to a phrase book with the old French phrases transliterated into Coptic, evidently intended for Coptic literate Christians, most probably monks, traveling in French-speaking Europe. Our apparition of Santa Maria at Casa Bream might be a similar phenomenon, except in reverse. European travelers transliterating a Nubian prayer and frankly getting parts of it badly wrong. The Santa embedded in the text as the only real clue as to the scribe's foreign origins. Now what happens if we try to reverse engineer the mangled phonetics in this text and force these words back into Old Nubian? I have to make a series of unsubstantiated guesses to get anywhere with the grammar and the results are not anything approaching certain at all. I think I can defend at least this much. Saint Mary conquers. Seeing her as a pillar, I, a sinner, came near, being in her shade. I wouldn't stake anything on this translation. Old Nubian can elude our understanding even when it's written correctly with predictable grammatical forms. And yet there is a certain poetry to this imagery, especially when we remember how brutally hot Christianity's first missionaries found Nubia on their arrival. And again, this is a Christianity of protection in which heaven's greatest powers, except God, conquer the evil of the world. Remember also my guess that we are dealing with a European traveler. This is not a random glimpse at Nubian Christianity, but something that either the Nubians or their guests thought that they ought to write down as representative of some larger whole. At this point, I admit that I am vulnerable to charges of cherry picking my evidence. I have approached Nubian Christianity through the lens of a handful of texts that are interesting to me. To some degree, this is a necessary evil. We do not yet have complete or systematic additions of all Nubian liturgical, religious, and magical texts from the Christian period. If any of you know anybody who's throwing money around this weekend, <laughs> we can talk. It, it might, however, be possible to get around this problem, to approach it from another direction, to start not with the Christian texts, but with standard documentary texts, and simply look for where Christians appear by accident and what they are doing in their unguarded moments. Alex has already shown you some of the land sales that we work with in Old Nubian. I think these land sales provide the best point of entry for what I'm trying to do. The participants in the transaction and the witnesses to it create the largest cast of characters we get in Nubian documents, with the exception of one or two bare bones accounts, which amount to no more than name lists. In the witness lists to these land sales, bishops and priests sit side by side with government officials, private citizens, men and women both, and the nameless people of the town we sometimes see appearing as an aggregate entity. I have argued elsewhere that the participants in the transaction might collect high-ranking witnesses as part of a prestige play to heighten the social legitimacy of their land sales. But these church officials do not appear in these texts doing anything churchy, right? They're simply there because they have social prestige, not because they are exercising any inherently Christian religious function. This suggests to me that the barrier between church and society is highly permeable if it exists at all. Now we also see evidence that this permeability works in both directions. Just as churchmen play a role in secular transactions, so do the laity play a role in church affairs. The epigraphic evidence, tombstones specifically, has drawn attention to the so-called rich ladies of Mayanarti, the island of Michael, another one of the sites excavated in the 1960s in anticipation of the rising waters of Lake Nasser. These rich ladies are interesting in their own right for what they tell us about gender and socioeconomic structures in medieval Nubia. But for our own purposes, these women are interesting because they are church owners, described as echon, having or holding the church of the four living creatures, or the church of Michael, or the church of St. Philotheos. What is true of the women of Minarti is true of men and women throughout medieval Nubia generally. 
to the highest levels of society. The great 12th century king, Moses George, himself owned a church of the Virgin Mary, possibly the central cathedral, the central church at Faras, Nubia's northern capital. Although we lack concrete evidence, we can safely speculate, I think, that men and women who own churches necessarily exert some influence over the priests and deacons of those churches. Nubia's church cannot be truly independent of external social and economic factors when some of its assets are under lay control. Oh, this is another one of the, we wish we had the original photo for this. I've been searching high and low for it one day, inshallah, but not yet. Uh, likewise, the church's independence from politics, which is uh, nearly non-existent, I think, we get hints of this in this text and in other pieces of documentary and literary evidence. In August of 1200 AD, in this text, Adama, the eparch of Nobadia, the highest political authority in northern Nubia, sells land at Kazaribrim in a place called Lower Uji, writing that, quote, it is the land in Lower Uji that I gave in my piety for the foundation of the church, setting it aside for the church of the Holy Trinity, unquote. Now, given the high-profile role that the eparchs of Nobadia played in instigating and in resolving revolts against the Nubian king in the 13th and 14th centuries, it seems likely that foundation gifts such as this one have long-term political implications. Now, an even more explicit claim about the connection between church and state appears in Arab literary sources. Abu al-Makaram writes that, quote, the number of kings in Nubia is 13, and all of them are priests and celebrate the liturgy within the sanctuary, unquote. Now, even making allowances for an outsider's poor understanding of Nubian ecclesiastical politics, we can suppose a close relationship between church practice and state ritual at the highest levels. This is all the more true when we remember that Nubian kings, on more than one occasion, retired into monastic life, and that Nubia's highest bishops were members of the royal family. Here's the one nice picture I'm going to give you. This is from Khazar Ibrahim. Bill Adam is one of the 20th century's greatest archaeologists of Nubia and the lead excavator of this site for quite some time, has written an unpublished conjectural history of Nubian Christianity, one part of which I think is worth sharing with you today. He wrote that, quote, for the Nubians, long accustomed to beings who were both human and divine, the question of Christ's nature was unimportant, not to say unintelligible. The issue for them was a wholly practical one, which side to choose in a struggle for control of the religious establishment, unquote. To put the matter in a somewhat different way, let me return to the beginning. Nubian Christianity may well have been Byzantine, it may well have been Monophysite, but so were other Christianities. I see no particular evidence that it mattered much to the Nubians, or that they gave it any real thought. They took these aspects of Christianity and kept them as they found them. To learn what Christianity really meant to a people, to see the uses to which they put it, you have to pay attention to what they change, where they fiddle. The texts that I have presented today, I think, give us that. Now, I see one particular problem with this argument, namely the vast amount of evidence that is lost. Many of the texts that we have in Nubia may seem unique, or at least peculiar, because of the degree to which other exemplars in the textual family tree have simply gone missing, because so many Coptic or Nubian or Ethiopic texts are lost or undiscovered or unedited. This is a real concern, but I do not think it completely derails my argument. The Nubian texts we have necessarily remind us of the ones we do not have. We have no history of the Nubian bishops to accompany the history of the Coptic patriarchs. There is no indication that the Nubians saw church history as a thing unto itself separate from the rest of society. We have no record of Nubian schism or Nubian heresy. There is no indication that the Nubians troubled themselves much 
with the questions that potentially lead to such divisions. Christianity is Nubia's shield. The state is its sword. The two are inseparable. When one is victorious, so is the other. Consider again the case of this man, King Moses George, who reigned for most of the second half of the 12th century AD. While we know his name only from Nubian texts, we have an apparent eyewitness account of him from quite a different source, an ambassador sent by none other than Saladin's brother, Shams Dullah. Moses George, facing one of the worst Muslim invasions of Nubian territory since the seventh century, laughed at the ambassador and, quote, ordered his men to stamp a cross on his hand with red hot iron, unquote. Here, Moses George and his red hot iron serve much the same protective function as Mary, as Michael, as Raphael. This is an embedded Christianity. I think we can speak of an embedded Christianity in the same way we might speak of an embedded economy. This approach to pre-industrial economies pioneered by Karl Polanyi argued that in an embedded economy, there are no distinct economic structures in and of themselves. Rather, economic activity takes place in the context of, that is, it's embedded in other social, cultural, and political institutions. Making the necessary changes, I propose that the same is true for Nubian Christianity. This is what I am hinting at in my title when I say that this is a Christianity without a church. Of course, there is a Nubian church, but it is too deeply embedded in Nubian society to be treated as a distinct institution. Likewise, other aspects of Nubian Christianity. Priests take part in secular economic transactions. Churches are private property. Bishops are close members of the royal family. Kings brand their enemies with the sign of the cross. Christianity is not a distinct aspect of Nubian society. It is part of its fabric. Now to conclude on a wildly speculative note, I wonder if there's a direct connection between this embeddedness I propose in Nubian Christianity and the somewhat heterodox nature of its theology. Some have supposed that Coptic Christianity's affinity for a Monophysite vision of Christ stems from more ancient Egyptian attitudes towards the relationship between humanity and divinity. Arguing by analogy, I might suppose that Nubia's embedded Christianity shaped the Nubian vision of the relationship between humanity and divinity. Seeing no clear distinction between church power and secular power, they saw no clear distinction among the heavenly powers. The result is a Christianity that is not simply of the Trinity, but of a constellation of archangels and other saints imbued with the powers of creation and protection. Thank you. Extend the session until uh, 1.15. Um, so again, please refrain from asking a question until you have a mic in hand. Uh, who would like to start us off? Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to say I completely enjoyed and learned a lot from all of your papers. I, I, was, I couldn't help but be struck by the, uh, your discussions of the nature of Christianity in Nubia and the earlier periods of Nubia, which I'm far more familiar with than I am of Christianity in Nubia. And um, I, it, your emphasis on Mary, for example, called to mind the worship of Isis throughout uh, the Meroitic period, uh, up through the fourth century, certainly, and all of those Meroitic chapels, not only in Meroe, but in uh, the Napatan area as well, not far from Dongola. And I'm wondering if uh, this is 
they your your idea of the uh, you know the the whole church as part of the state is also a reflection of earlier uh, uh, pre-Christian ideas of where the king was high priest as well, which goes back thousands of years in in that area. And I'm wondering, uh, first of all, what you think of that, but also uh, whether there might not be more parallels with uh, ancient Nubia into Christian Nubia, where really there was no break as far as I uh, understand it, other than you know, the influence of religion. Check, check. Can you hear me? OK. I would subscribe to what I take to be the, the Bill Adams orthodoxy on this question, which is that we're really talking about the continuous and uninterrupted history of a single people, not a people that has been disturbed or interrupted or invaded or transplanted in some way, but these are Nubians all the way back from the beginning. And, and so what I think you see in response to your question is Nubians who have a particular worldview picking up new vocabulary along the way to express that worldview and abandoning some of the old ways of doing it and picking up new ways of doing it, but the it is the same. And so if I were doing a more material cultural presentation, you would see this in some very striking ways in which you have Meroitic funeral planks that look exactly like Christian funeral planks. It's the same kind of object, it's shaped the same way, put on the dead bodies in the same way. It's just 100 years later, it's about the Psalms, not about what they were doing in Meroe. So same idea is expressed in different ways. If, if I can add, um, there is a, a very nice example of this uh, continuity of uh, cultures in the Mid-Nile region. Uh, near the third cataract, there is a site called Masida. And it's characterized uh, today uh, by uh, a church, a very little church. You could call it even a chapel. But it follows the patterns that have been established for late uh, Christian uh, church architecture in Nubia, especially by Adams. Now, nothing particular about that, except for the fact that this is built with its apse, so the eastern most sacred part of the church, against the rock powder. We, uh, on which we still see uh, rock art dated to the Meroitic period and depicting a Meroitic prince at the place where you would have whatever apt decoration Christians would choose. So I would give that as a lyric example of this continuity. Uh, just a footnote, Alexandros, to, to, to think. Uh, to point out the curious cultural continuities in black America. My um, father was Episcopalian. All the Gateses are Episcopalians. My great uh, grandmother and grandfather were part of the founders of the Black Episcopal Church in Cumberland, Maryland, which is halfway between Washington and Pittsburgh, where all of our family's been from for 200 years. And it's called St. Philip's Episcopal Church. And I never thought anything about that until I went to, I don't know where, Pittsburgh or New York, and there was another St. Philip's Episcopal Church that was black. Now, all the Episcopal churches that were black were named for St. Philip's, St. Philip because of the, the story of the uni. The other thing is there's an organization of black women who I think call themselves uh, the Candices or the Candices, but they've lost the etymology from Kandiki, right, and not knowing that it came from the, the Queen of Meroe who dispatched her treasurer and, you know, Philip um, saw him. So it's just curious that it's still, this tradition still is alive and people might not necessarily be aware of what its origins, both traditions. Um, Hello? Yeah. It's a very interesting point and thank you for bringing it up. Um, I would even mention as, a, as an adapt, uh, uh, the story of um, uh, the role of the name Kush in uh, African-American circles, as well as the wish of uh, Southern Sudanese people to call their country after independence in July 2011, Kush. Right, so...
Hello? Okay. I, I, I think a lot of people still focus on the literary evidence that Alexandros spoke about and, and look to the sixth century for sort of official conversion narratives, but I think increasingly there are more people who see material evidence of, of economic contacts from Egypt to Nubia that are bringing Christianity in the fourth and the fifth centuries. Well, it, it, well, yeah, one second, one second. Uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind about Ethiopia is that they had to do it all over again a couple centuries later, right? I, don't, I hope my Ethiopian colleagues would, would agree with me that the, the nine saints are talking about really re-Christianizing a country that had maybe not been for, thoroughly Christianized in the first place. So that's part of the time lag there, I think. Alexandros obviously has something. Uh, uh, yeah, be, before talking about Ethiopia, I think that what, what I tried to, to, to sketch in, in, in the presentation of the Christianization, definitely it's not only the uh, written sources, we need to combine with archaeology, and yes, you're absolutely right, Christianity did come to Kush from uh, Aksum too. It's just that I see at least uh, four uh, different uh, moves uh, of uh, Christianity. You have these early uh, contacts with Egypt already from, from the uh, Roman empires, uh, times you have the the missionary activities that come uh, afterwards, and that concerns uh, the uh, um, uh, upstream movement of uh, the religion into Sudan. But when you want to see the Meroitic heartlands, we even have uh, the uh, monumental epigraphic evidence of uh, Aksumites being present in the realm of uh, Ezana before and after the conversion. So uh, at this turning point, and then it's John of Ephesus who as I said, finds Atharthodokites from Aksum in Soba, which obviously did not convert the population, but they made Christianity known. Now, all these movements mean little for what medieval Nubia would become as, a, let's say, a, a church embedded in state or a religion being a part of the fabric of what the Nubian society is, to quote a known colleague and friend, um, it's what the Makuritan kings will decide to do after their own conversion and how they will integrate the territory of the old Meroitic Empire under a new flag, having as a sign whatever Christian sign they would use upon this flag. I'm afraid um, uh, we have to conclude in order to protect lunch, um, which we all have a stake in. So uh, please join me in thanking our three speakers one last time. <laughs> <laughs>